Good morning. Good morning to all and welcome to Departmental Grand Rounds. I'm George Waits, one of the Internal Medicine Chiefs, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, uh, pre uh, presenter, faculty presenter. This is Dr. Karen Morse. Uh, Dr. Morse uh, comes back to us here at Wake Forest um, after a, a, a wonderful background I'm uh, looking forward to sharing with you. She initially had uh, obtained her Bachelor's of Arts with distinction from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and uh, there she continued and obtained her MD uh, degree there at, at UVA. Uh, she then uh, obtained a, an MPH at, the, at UNC Chapel Hill, and from there came to Wake Forest, where she completed her residency here, and uh, as well as her uh, infectious disease fellowship here at Wake. And from there, she went to the NIH, where uh, she uh, conducted a clinical research fellowship in HIV and in AIDS, and there she remained employed uh, through 2017 uh, at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at, at the NIH. Uh, she did uh, a lot of very impressive work there, was actually awarded uh, the NIH Bench to Bedside Award eight times over her, uh, over her uh, period there, and uh, presented and published broadly on topics uh, involving HIV and metabolism, uh, which uh, she will be uh, addressing uh, for us today. Uh, she is boarded in internal medicine and in infectious disease, and we are so glad to have welcomed her here back in 2017 as an associate professor in uh, the section uh, of ID. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Morris as she presents to us on the obesity and HIV-infected adults, uh, the excess of success. Um, we'll just do this, I think. Thanks. Hi, it's great to be back. That's a little loud. Let me know if it's too loud. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, so let me just walk through the objectives so we're all on the same page about what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to look at changes in obesity prevalence in HIV-infected adults in our most recent antiretroviral era. We're going to look at the coincident cardiometabolic disease we're seeing in the setting of increasing obesity, and then we're going to talk about screening and treatment. The outline, we're covering two very big topics, and I was asked on Monday to try to truncate this to a 35 or 40 minute talk, so I'll do my best. But just a reminder that these are worldwide epidemics. HIV affects about 37 million worldwide, and then obesity is 2 billion. So their overlap um, is becoming increasingly large, and I'll walk you through a little bit of history of HIV just to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm not sure when you last had an HIV-related grand rounds, so I just want to update you on where we're at. We'll do a case that illustrates what the challenges we, we're facing. Talk about body composition changes, which is the broad phrase we used to use to describe a wide spectrum of changes in weight. Talk about obesity and HIV. Ooh. Moving on its own, am I doing that? Sorry. Um, and then we'll talk, as I mentioned, about management and areas for future research. So where are we at in 2019? Um, well, as I mentioned, 37 million worldwide. More and more people are on antiretroviral therapy, so about half now of infected HIV patients worldwide are getting the therapy they need. Uh, there's still a lot of barriers to care in the developing world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. There's about 1.8 million new diagnoses a year, and our goal is to have that over the next 10 years. Uh, we're slowly working towards that goal, and then nearly a million deaths per year. In the U.S., 1.1 million infected. 85% of them know about their infection, but still one in seven are still undiagnosed, and that's an area of uh, research we're trying to tap into. Um, and then what's shown on the right there are the UNAIDS 20 uh, 20 targets, which is the 90-90-90 goal, and this is an international goal to try to get 90% of HIV patients diagnosed, 90% of those patients on treatment, and 90% of those patients suppressed on um, antiretroviral therapy. And you can see by the maybe half empty ribbon there in the middle, these are the U.S. numbers, we're 85% diagnosed. Oh. Is it on a timer? Do I have it on something? I must have it on a... Yeah, sorry. Um, let me fix that for you guys so I don't keep getting disoriented. 
Um, and only about, anyway, about 57% are on treatment and maybe 80 or so percent of those are suppressed. And those numbers are similar to what we see in our clinic, although I think it, it varies by population and setting. Sorry about that, thanks. Um, and as you can see, these were goals for 2020, so you know we're probably not gonna meet them. There are nations in the world that are meeting these goals, but the majority of us are still trying to catch up. And then there's uh, equally ambitious goals for 2030 to further have diagnoses and get everybody on treatment. And then obviously our goal is to eradicate HIV infection by 2040. So looking at the U.S. numbers, we've held steady around 40,000 new diagnoses a year. Uh, last year was actually about 38, or 2017 was about 38,000, so maybe a slight improvement. 75% of new infections are in men and 25% in women. We've seen gradual reductions in new infection rates in all age groups except 25 to 34, and that remains a group that's challenging to reach out to, uh, but it's a group we target with prevention messages and a group we'd love to get on uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent new infections. Risk factors haven't changed a lot in the modern era. Uh, the majority of risk is male-to-male -male sexual contact, about 30% heterosexual contact, and then IV drug abuse and mixed modes of transmission make up for the rest of new infections. And I wanted to share this slide, which is rates of diagnosis of HIV infection, because it highlights a problem we're facing in the South. 53% of new HIV diagnoses are in southern states, and similar numbers for AIDS, which are shown in the darker orange. And I postulate this is in part due to funding. You know, these are often states that didn't expand uh, Medicaid, and so they have limited resources for outreach, prevention, including PrEP, and test and treat strategies. The great news in HIV, which all of you probably know, is that with the introduction of combination antiretroviral therapy in the late 90s, we've seen a tremendous reduction in death rates. And that's indicated by that hot pink arrow there. Um, and with that, we've seen a rise in median age at death. And just to remind the young people here, uh, when people were diagnosed with HIV early in the epidemic, their expected lifespan was uh, less than 40 years. It's now closer to 60, and people that are diagnosed now are extrapolated to have probably a normal lifespan. And so a really a, a real testament to the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy and our improvement in diagnostics and management. And just to remind you about antiretroviral therapy, when I was here before, we were really struggling to get patients to take their medicine because effective combination therapy required multiple pills, multiple medications, and multiple doses per day. Now, and really for the last five or six years, we can give almost everyone a single pill that includes three or four antiretrovirals in a fixed dose combination. These are somewhat to scale, so the pills are smaller, they're easier to take, they don't require refrigeration, and so they're much easier to adhere to. They appear to have a better side effect profile, so we're very fortunate to be able to offer this now to patients. And on the left of the screen is the POS HIV drug chart from last year, and that entire red bordered column on the left are fixed dose combinations. And so the majority of patients coming into care or even already in care can be treated with a single pill a day with HIV, for HIV. The other big news in the last five or six years has been a change in when we start therapy. We used to use CD4 declines to help guide our decision making. This was driven in part by the toxicity of medications. We didn't want to put people on tough to take meds uh, until we really had to. There was a lot of debate about even doing this study, but it's really probably been one of the most um, practice changing trials uh, that's come out in the last 10 years for us. Basically, they randomized patients with high CD4 counts, a so CD4 over 500, to either start antiretroviral therapy right away or wait until their CD4 declined. And the study was actually stopped early because there was a huge divergence. Patients that were not on therapy had higher non-AIDS and AIDS-related complications and all-cause mortality. And then later analyses have shown higher rates of heart attack, renal disease, and other complications. And so now we basically, as soon as we get someone into care, try to get them on therapy. And then we're working towards, in some parts of the country, we're able to do basically the day you're diagnosed, start your antiretroviral therapy. And that's really what we're working towards. Causes of death, we still see about a third um, of deaths in HIV related to, HIV, uh, related to AIDS, but actually the bulk of them. See my lawyer? Good. 
Uh, but about 45% are non-AIDS complications. Uh, liver disease is the predominant one, and most of this is related to viral hepatitis and end-stage liver disease. Uh, but then non-AIDS cancers and cardiovascular disease make up another significant chunk. Death risk is increased as it is in the HIV negative population with increasing age and male sex, also with immunocompromised, so low CD4 count, and then with a lot of modifiable factors like smoking, high blood pressure, and diabetes. So this is a case a guy took care of about five years ago at the NIH. Uh, he's a 40-year-old gentleman. He presented with a new diagnosis of HIV and pneumocystis pneumonia. He was hospitalized. He had a very rough course. He was actually diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis during his PCP treatment. But he got on antiretroviral therapy, and he did overall very well. And what this graphic shows in green off the chart, his viral load was about 200,000 at diagnosis, and it fell within a month or so to almost below detection stayed flat, and with that, he had a beautiful rise in his CD4 count from about 70, up, 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 over 200 within about six, seven months, and then over 500, 600 by five years. So this is the kind of success we're aiming for with HIV therapy, and this is a patient who was a success. He went back to work, he was caring for his children, he was doing great, but with this CD4 rise, he also had a BMI rise. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in hot pink, you can see his BMI, and it's a little hard to look across the axis is on the right, but he started around 17, so underweight, rapidly had weight gain that brought him back into the normal BMI range. So he was thrilled. He looked normal. He felt, thought he looked healthy. He felt better. But that weight gain continued, and it continued robustly through the first year. He gained almost 60 pounds, and then it sort of leveled out but continued to rise until he rose through the overweight range up into the obese range. Um, and with that weight gain, he developed metabolic complications, hyperlipidemia, which we diagnosed around six months. And then he had this erratic jump in his ALT and AST, his liver-associated enzymes, um, and was evaluated actually under a clinical trial that I was part of. He had oral glucose tolerance testing, diagnosed him with diabetes, and then he had a liver biopsy that found non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and bridging fibrosis, so liver scarring progressing towards cirrhosis. Um, and so he went from a single pill at the top there for HIV therapy, which was all he was taking at the point at that point, to having to take medication for cholesterol, diabetes, blood pressure, and eventually aspirin. So that was the price of success for this gentleman. Uh, so I'll walk you through just a little bit of history, really to indulge myself and some of my ID colleagues, uh, just to remind you of where we were and how different what we're dealing with now is. Early in the epidemic, even before I was into it, we were dealing with weight changes, but it was usually weight loss, unexplained weight loss, which we referred to as HIV wasting. This was an AIDS-defining condition defined as an unintentional weight loss of 10% or more. It affected probably 30% of patients, and when we saw it, we got worried because we knew it meant they were having disease progression, they had a higher risk of opportunistic infection, and an increased risk of death. We still see this, although it's much uh, less frequent, and it's usually in patients who are struggling with injection drug use, food insecurity, or homelessness. And I couldn't find a great AIDS wasting picture, so I put Jared Leto from Dallas Buyers Club, and the reason I put it here really is just to point out that he and Matthew McConaughey both lost 50 or 60 pounds to play AIDS patients from the 90s, which I think just hits home the degree of wasting we were really seeing. Right about the time we introduced antiretroviral therapy, we were still struggling to get patients to keep on weight and gain weight. The medicines were very tough to take. They caused a lot of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And then we noticed some unexpected toxicities, um, one that was called lactic acidosis, hepatic steatosis syndrome, but also some changes in muscle and fat distribution. I'll show you on the next slide. And, uh, the picture here is an image from one of the initial case reports of stavudine or D4T-associated lactic acidosis hepatic steatosis syndrome. So patients would come in in metabolic acidosis, often it had been the ICU, and this gentleman imaging showed liver infiltration with fat, hepatic steatosis. He had a liver biopsy that showed mixed micro and macrovesicular steatosis. And then because his uh, muscle enzymes were up and he was weak, he also had a muscle biopsy which showed fat infiltration around the muscle fibers, and this is antiretroviral-associated myopathy. We almost never see this anymore, but it's still in the information for patients, and so sometimes they'll ask me, what is this lactic acidosis hepatic steatosis syndrome? Um, but I don't think I've seen it in 10 years probably. But it's what we used to worry about. <clears throat> 
And then the other component of that, around the time we introduced protease inhibitors, we started to see other body composition changes. Lipoatrophy, which is fat loss, usually in the temples and cheeks, and then also in the extremities. Uh, and then a different, but perhaps related syndrome of visceral fat accumulation, which would be increased fat deposition around your internal organs. And the graphic, um, just to orient you, this is a gentleman, and you can see he complained that his belly was getting more and more protuberant. And you can see actually the outline of his ribs and then the sort of outline of his stomach muscles. And this is his CT across section below. And in black is fat, and he really has no subcutaneous fat, but his organs are surrounded by fat. And so this is visceral adiposity. And just for comparison, two slightly more normal CT cross sections on the right, and this one has sort of a normal amount or maybe increased amount of subcutaneous fat, visceral fat, and then the one in the bottom is really mostly subcutaneous fat. So lipodystrophy affected a lot of patients back then, and this is sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, which I know seems like a long time ago, but a lot of these patients are still around. Um, and it impacted patients a lot. They felt that medicines were making them look and feel worse, and so they often were non-adherent. The etiology was probably multifactorial, and it was probably more than one process going on. The lipoatrophy, that fat loss, was pretty clearly a medication effect, probably related to mitochondrial toxicity. The visceral fat accumulation wasn't as clear. There were some cohorts where uh, it didn't look like there was really that much more visceral fat in the negatives versus the positives. Um, but we were seeing it nevertheless, and so we studied a number of medications to try to treat it, uh, metformin, thiodalazine diones, growth hormone analogs, and antiretroviral switch. What's shown on the right here is an old trial, but I think it uh, impacted our practice a lot. It looked like patients that were on the older drugs that switched to the newer drugs had an increase in limb fat, and so these were patients on D4T or AZT switching to a newer agent called abacavir had minimal but nevertheless improvement in their limb fat. Because of our concern about these toxicities, we started to look for antiretroviral alternatives, and pharmaceutical manufacturers really took this to heart and started looking at metabolic complications as part of their pre-drug evaluation and only bringing newer drugs to market that looked like they had a relatively favorable metabolic profile. So they looked to see about impact on lipids and body composition. And so when drugs came to market in the late 2000s, mid-2000s, we knew a lot more about what to expect. So we saw less and less lipoatrophy and visceral fat accumulation, but we started seeing more and more just regular old obesity. And so I put a picture here to illustrate the visceral fat. Now we started seeing that mixed picture with increased visceral fat, but also just regular subcutaneous obesity. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about obesity a little bit. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. You guys probably know this uh, as well as I do, but we usually define it by body mass index. And so that's your weight over your height squared. And we break it widely into classes, and we say there's an, a wide normal range. Um, but BMI is not perfect. It probably underestimates obesity in some populations and might overestimate it in others. <clears throat> we can look at body fat in other ways, although it tends to be more invasive, and so it's usually something we just do in clinical trials using things like DEXA scans. Um, and I'll be talking about obesity. When you hear me say it, I'm going to mean central or abdominal obesity, so a combination of visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. A few of the studies I'll mention talk about waist circumference, so that's just measuring our waist or waist to hip ratio. Again, just measuring it with a tape measure and making a ratio of your hip to your waist. Those markers are more tightly linked to increases in visceral fat uh, and have better data in HIV negative populations for risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and just to give you a little background on obesity, because I'm not sure we've had a talk on this here recently. The U.S. is one of the fattest countries in the world, if not the fattest. Um, the graphic on the right uh, stratifies countries by reported uh, obesity, and you can see we're at the bottom, which is not where you want to be. Our overall prevalence is almost 40%. I'm sure the endocrine folks here could comment on this as well. Um, and we know there's related conditions and morbidities that go with that, as well as costs. One thing that struck me since I've been back here is, is really the, the tremendous number of morbidly obese patients and related complications we see in the hospital. That's increased since I was here before. Um, certain groups are more affected, their racial differences, and it appears that higher education level and more money helps protect against it. And just to remind you, this is the trend in the U.S. It's broken into large categories of date. 
Uh, but really around the mid-90s, we started to see a tremendous rise in men and women in general obesity and in extreme obesity. And in children, it's been even more profound. It's hard to see that black line probably, but that's the median line. We've really had obesity rates quite low in children up until the 90s, about 5%, and now they're rising to 15%. And I think it's unclear how this will translate into adult obesity, but you guys know these are big concerns. So with all that background, we're going to talk about that overlap between HIV and obesity and why I think you should care about it and why I think we should be doing more research to try to manage it. This is probably the best data we have, and it really raised a lot of eyebrows when it first came out because I think we'd all been seeing more obesity in our patients but didn't really realize to what extent. This is a military cohort, and so when you're in the military, you're somewhat routinely tested for HIV. And so you have to realize we would catch patients early in infection for the most part, with the caveat that probably the first couple data points on here in the early 80s may have been patients with slightly more advanced disease. But taking that into consideration, looking at the weight at time of diagnosis, the majority of patients uh, in the 80s and early 90s were in the normal weight range, and then that uh, stippled line in the middle marks when you move into obesity, and really over the last 10 plus years, more and more patients are coming in at the time of diagnosis already overweight. And to look at that another way, Back in the early part of the epidemic, 70% of HIV-infected patients were in the healthy weight range, and now it's less than 50. This graphic's from another North American cohort. So this is Canada, U.S., and Mexico, so not just U.S. data, and was looking at obesity prevalence cross-sectionally. Obesity was probably about 10% in the early part and doubled within 10 years. And what this shows, and it's a little hard to look at. So I'll just show you this. My pointer. So what you've got is cohort participants on the left, uh, age and sex matched, uh, and Haynes participants on the right, and you can see that for women, which is the light gray, and men, which is the dark gray, we've had a gradual rise uh, in weight at the time of starting antiretroviral therapy. And now we've really gone from being an underweight, malnourished HIV population to being essentially equivalent to the HIV negative population in weight and BMI. Looking at weight gain over time, once you start any retroviral therapy, this is they broke their data down into year of initiation. This is probably hard for you all to see too. Um, but the black line is from, I think, 1990 and shows uh, that patients would have a rise, even, was it 90? 98, sorry, would have a rise, but then they'd usually attenuate it. People would try notice they were gaining weight and they were able to get it back under control. But what we've seen in more recent years is this probably best illustrated by that teal line where they just gain weight, they gain weight, they gain weight, and they gain weight. And it doesn't seem that uh, us pointing that out or any other interventions we try is able to reverse it. And this is just looking at that same data a different way, try to stratify it by years of therapy. And the real point here is just that we see a dramatic rise in the first year. Majority of patients gain the weight they're gonna gain in that first year, certainly over the first three years, and there may be some differences by race and sex. This is from the DAD cohort, so this is an international cohort, but it has a lot of U.S. patients in it, and it makes the point that weight gain is, in fact, the greatest in people that are underweight, and so that's a group that I think we're usually encouraging to gain weight. We want them to have better nutrition. We want them to have normal muscle mass, and so we often are saying eat more, drink and sure shakes, but it's a group that uh, is prone to overgaining, and the case I presented, I think, illustrates that. He was underweight, so I'm sure I was telling him to eat and do whatever he wanted to try to re rebuild his body, but perhaps the habits that people form in that initial part of recovery translate into unhealthy long-term eating and lifestyle habits. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about the overlapping uh, comorbidities. We know diabetes and fatty liver disease are components of general obesity, and they're also being seen at higher rates in HIV. Talk about cardiovascular disease. The relationship between weight and cardiovascular disease and HIV is not clear, <clears throat> it's also not clear in the general population, just being heavy all by itself may not predispose you to heart disease, um, but maybe that we just aren't looking at it enough yet in our HIV population. For time, I've cut the slides on multimorbidity, neurocognitive impairment, and obesity-related malignancies, but suffice it to say there is some data suggesting that these are also rising in HIV-affected patients in association with weight gain. So we've known for some time that diabetes and 
risk increases with increasing BMI, and this is data from 2012, it's French data, but similar to data we've seen here, basically the higher your BMI, the higher your weight of diabetes, where obese patients have about threefold increase in risk of diabetes, and if your waist circumference is up, you have an almost fourfold. And this is probably the most important study I'll show you today. This looked at veterans in the VA system, uh, men and women, and for, compared them to age, sex, and BMI matched, baseline BMI matched HIV negative veterans. The HIV positive veterans at the same BMI had a higher risk of diabetes. And when their weight went up, it was associated with an increased risk of diabetes over the HIV negative. And so this really suggested that there is something different about HIV patients, whether it's comorbidities or HIV related specific factors, I think we're still sorting out. But HIV patients are at higher risk, and so even in the normal range, you can see a BMI in the normal range 20 to 24, they had a higher risk. And so maybe we need to be monitoring them or looking at them differently or trying to think a little bit harder about how to mitigate their metabolic risks. And just another slide to reinforce that, in cohort data, we've seen a prevalence of diabetes rise from 7% to about 15% uh, over 10 or so years. And then a recent meta-analysis looking at a variety of cohorts, diabetes rates are about twice as high in HIV-infected patients. Pre-diabetes rates are high. And this is their data, and I, I don't know exactly how to interpret person years, but basically they said that over about four years in a cohort of 1,000 patients, you'd expect 50 new diabetes diagnoses and about 400 pre-diabetes. That's almost half the cohort would be at risk moving forward. And so diabetes and HIV, it would make sense that there might be an increased risk. There's traditional risk factors that we see lots of, and as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more obesity. We see the traditional risk factors of inactivity, some ge genetic and racial predisposition, and then HIV-specific factors. So I mentioned the visceral adiposity that some of our patients have from back in the olden days. Some probably are still getting peripheral lipoatrophy, other changes in muscle and liver fat. Inflammation, which I'm not going to get into a lot today, but HIV patients tend to live in a more inflamed milieu. So because perhaps chronic infection or other immune dysregulation, they have higher circulating markers of inflammation, which can be associated with increased risk of insulin uh, sensitive resistance and diabetes. And then we see some factors that are probably a little bit unique to HIV, lower testosterone levels, hepatitis co-infection, and probably some antiretroviral effects. The older medications were blamed, but I'll show you some data towards the end of this talk on newer medications and their association with weight gain. Now we'll transition to fatty liver, which is what I've done most of my work in. Um, and fatty liver, you guys hopefully know, is that spectrum where uh, you get fat in your liver, and that might be benign, that's hepatic steatosis. Some portion of patients go on to get inflammation associated with that fat in their liver, that's NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And some portion of those patients go on to have more significant liver disease complications, including metabolic syndrome, increased risk of liver cancer, and increased risk of liver-related death. In HIV, we've largely dealt with hepatitis as a major cause of liver disease, but we're doing better and better, both recognizing it and treating it. And as you guys know, with our DAA agents, we're able to cure most people uh, with three months of therapy. And so with all these effective treatments, we're seeing less and less hepatitis-related decompensation. And fatty liver, just like in the general population, is rising as a cause of liver failure and as an indication for liver transplant. How common is it? This is similar to the issue with um, obesity and HIV. It looks like it's probably at least as common in HIV and probably more. So we knew in the early antiretroviral era and people that had severe malnutrition and disarray from opportunistic infection, we actually saw high rates of macrovesicular steatosis. But what we've seen now with rising rates of obesity is more traditional NAFLD. And in a meta-analysis, it looked like it was maybe 35% HIV in patients were in affected by fatty liver, this is based on imaging, which isn't perfect, and that was compared to about 25% in HIV negative, and then NASH, the more inflamed condition associated with NAFLD, had a prevalence of about 40%, which appeared higher, again, than HIV negative populations. But this is tough. These are often studies based on small numbers or non-invasive assessment of liver disease, and so they're imperfect. A slightly older study looked at the MAX cohort, and these HIV negative and positive gay men that are followed over time. 
And in that cohort, using imaging, it actually looked like the HIV-negative men had higher rates of steatosis. Um, so I think we're still sorting out whether it's really more common. However, there's a suggestion that it is more severe in some of my own data where we looked at liver biopsy in patients who had relatively minor increases in their ALT and AST, and they underwent evaluation for viral hepatitis was ruled out. They had no history of alcohol abuse. We did liver biopsies, and 70% of them had fatty liver, over half had NASH, and we found a pretty significant prevalence of bridging fibrosis, uh, bordering on cirrhosis, and about 20%. It appeared primarily related to BMI, so weight, uh, also markers of insulin resistance, and then some genetics. This is a case control study that looked at HIV patients who underwent liver biopsy for concern of NAFLD and NASH, and age and sex and BMI matched them with HIV negatives. And they, even with the small study, they thought that it looked like the HIV patients, in fact, did have a more malignant presentation with higher liver enzymes higher rates of NASH and higher rates of fibrosis, so similar to what I saw. And then there was another trial that um, tried to compare using imaging. It looked like we were seeing fatty liver occurring at lower BMIs. So maybe HIV patients have a more fulminant course with fatty liver. Maybe it happens at a lower BMI. And similar to diabetes, I think it makes sense. We have a, a high prevalence of traditional risk factors and then these additive HIV-specific risk factors. Um, bacterial translocation is a possible mechanism of fatty liver disease, and we know with gut disruption with HIV infection and lymphocytosis, I mean, lymphopenia, we see uh, probably increased rates of dysbiosis. There's also an immune activation and inflammation in HIV that might contribute, and then HIV-specific and antiretroviral factors. So that ends up being a multi-hit to the liver. Why do we care and why am I trying to convince people to look for this a little bit more? I think as uh, we learn more about NAFLD, we realize it does have significant consequences. We see hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with NASH, maybe NAFLD, in the absence of cirrhosis. And as I mentioned, NAFLD is becoming in the general population a major indication for liver transplant, often because of hepatocellular carcinoma. And I think uh, right now we're not really looking at our patients and screening them, but if HIV contributes to risk and HIV might contribute to cancer risk independently, which we won't get into today, something we potentially could see a lot of. NASH itself contributes liver-related mortality. Uh, and then there's associations with chronic kidney disease, sleep apnea, and coronary disease. It's not clear if this is just because of shared risk factors or if really fatty liver all by itself is causing disruptions that predispose you to these. Um, we're still sorting that out, and there's very limited data in HIV to date. But as I mentioned, NAFLD is associated with cardiovascular disease, uh, both markers and clinical events. And in HIV, we have a little bit of data that suggests that NAFLD independently is associated with coronary calcium, which would be a marker of cardiovascular disease risk. Again, we're not sure if this is an HIV or NAFLD-specific problem, but we're seeing it. And then for years, we debated whether cardiovascular disease really happened more in HIV independent of traditional risk factors. I think most of us have come to believe that it does, and this is older data that shows MI rates in HIV compared to HIV negatives, and that risk increases in the HIV quite uh, strikingly over time, separating out from HIV negatives. And it's combination of traditional risk factors and HIV-specific risk factors. And I say BMI, I think I mentioned at the beginning, doesn't necessarily predict for cardiovascular disease events. And this is some data looking at risk factors for MI and HIV. It was a study that identified a link with protease inhibitors. And then the majority of the risk factors are traditional, so age, uh, male sex, smoking, diabetes. Uh, but BMI at the bottom did not look statistically significant. And looking at it a different way, and this is a tough graphic to look at, this is uh, incidence risk ratio on the left. And then they tried to look at it in a couple different models, which are what the different uh, circle triangle squares are. Basically, they divided people up by BMI and looked at how a change in BMI increases their risk of cardiovascular disease. This is a huge study, 35,000 people. It looked like, in fact, the normal weight people had the highest risk, increased risk of cardiovascular disease with weight gain. Um, they didn't really see a signal for obese patients. And then when they divided patients differently by quartiles of weight, maybe the middle quartiles had more risk of cardiovascular disease with weight gain. But this is still something we're trying to sort out. And so hopefully I've convinced you that we're seeing more obesity in HIV, that it's associated with increased risk of diabetes and fatty liver disease, 
possibly going to translate into cardiovascular disease. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this, I cut the slides, but there is more multimorbidity, so this is sort of you combined comorbidities. The obesity, obese HIV patients have a rate of about 60%. Uh, so significant multimorbidity, data on neurocognitive impairment, and then as I mentioned, a little bit of data suggesting obesity-related malignancies are increasing in HIV, like breast cancer and colon cancer. Uh, so we'll talk about management, and just to remind you, the risk factors that we want to target when we think about management are not necessarily intuitive. So the data I showed you suggests that patients that are underweight are actually at highest risk for significant and malignant weight gain. We know patients with advanced HIV disease are often underweight and therefore we need to watch them a little more closely for their weight gain. Older age is actually associated. I tend to think of older age as a time of wasting, but actually sort of that lower part of older age, so 60s, 50s, 60s, we need to watch. And then I want to show you a little bit of data on our newer agents, uh, integrase inhibitors, that suggest we may be seeing a more dangerous amount of weight gain with those. So I saw this patient Tuesday that's on the right there. She's uh, African originally and was on a tripla for about 10 years with a weight that stayed stable between 105 and 110 pounds. Um, and I felt that her risk of long-term toxicity with a tripla, even though she's only about 32, uh, I thought I should do her a favor and get her onto a new agent. So I switched her to one of our new fixed dose combinations, Victarvi, uh, which Gilead makes and they predict will take over the market. Um, and they probably are right. So I switched her about six months ago um, after twisting her arm, she's like, oh, I'm doing so well on a trip. I'm like, no, no, you'll do better. So I put her on Big Tarvey, saw her once back to make sure things were going well, and then I saw her again Tuesday, and she said, Doc, I think this medicine's making me gain weight, and she's gained 20 pounds. I mean, I guess there could be other factors at work, but nothing else in her life has really changed, and so not to make an anecdote fact, but I use it to walk us into the data on integrase inhibitors. I dismissed this data, and thought people were just overreacting, maybe because of a sort of a selection bias. I mean, we're putting patients where we're worried about metabolic disorders on these drugs, and also we're starting them in this more modern age where we're just starting with a higher level of obesity. But it does look like patients gain weight once we start them, uh, an average of about six pounds at a year for most uh, patients making a change. So these are patients that are doing well, and then we switch them. And then in a retrospective analysis, really didn't have a ton of patients on these drugs, but nevertheless found this tremendous increase, a seven times greater weight gain with integrase inhibitors, three times oh, the annual weight gain, three times greater overall weight gain, and then a greater risk of severe weight gain. So this is really more targeted at my ID colleagues, but I think it's something that um, we need to be watching for probably a little bit more. The dilemma is these are fantastic drugs. I mean, they work beautifully. They're easy to take. They really have an overall great side effect profile. But if they are, in fact, causing this dangerous amount of weight gain, they are going to create a whole new set of metabolic complications. Um, we're trying to pull our own data here to try to get a better handle on it. The drug company, of course, says this is not a signal, um, but I guess it remains to be seen. And then just to put in a little bit of a political plug, I mean, insurance status affects this as well, and so does poverty. And what this study out of Birmingham shows is that patients uh, that are minorities and they're uninsured, have much more market weight gain on antiretroviral therapy. So, I mean, this is um, unclear why this is. I assume this has to do in part with food choices and food accessibility, but something that uh, we can't really control for, but nevertheless impacts weight gain and metabolic risk. So how do we screen? I just, to mention the stuff we talked about before, we're, we generally screen almost everybody in HIV, but perhaps we need to think a little bit harder about screening patients we wouldn't traditionally worry about, underweight patients, more sick patients. Our guidelines call for pretty aggressive screening, but I don't think we realistically practice it. It actually says we should do oral glucose tolerance testing before we start therapy, uh, fasting lipids, but in our zeal now to get patients on treatment as quickly as possible, this often falls by the wayside. But I think at the very least, we should try to get a set of fasting labs uh, when we start therapy, probably at around six months and at a year, and then any time anything big changes. So when that patient came in Tuesday and she's gained 20, weight, 20 pounds, I'm going to plan to do fasting labs next time I see her. Um, we also don't measure waist circumference, and I don't know what the internal medicine practice is. I mean, it's something we probably could check. It's not that hard. We'd have to get the nurses probably to do it. But it might help flag patients that are at higher risk and give us a place to start talking about weight management. 
And then we generally follow liver function tests in HIV about every four months, and so we're generally going to catch changes. But just like we watch for subtle changes in creatinine, you know, of 1 to 1.4, maybe we need to be watching for changes in liver-associated enzymes. So if a patient starts at 20 and now they're 45, maybe that's a sign that something's starting to happen that we should be looking for. It's not easy, but we can certainly get ultrasound imaging and elastography in-house if we're able to pay for it. This is a challenge for a lot of our HIV patients who have good coverage mostly for their HIV medications, but for ancillary-related procedures, consult and imaging, it's not always easy to pay for. And then counseling, which I don't know now how you guys are trained. We certainly weren't trained when I was here to do weight loss counseling in any really aggressive way. Probably that's better now. Um, but I do think we need to remember that if we mention it, it sometimes has an impact. I've certainly said it offhandedly to patients. You might gain weight, try to watch it, and they've come in and lost weight. So don't give up. Uh, but if they can lose about 5% of their weight, it will reduce their risk of diabetes. It actually reverses fatty liver disease and can reduce their risk of other metabolic complications. And really, you're aiming to get back in that normal range, but any amount of weight loss is beneficial. I think we need to make patients aware they might gain weight with therapy. We spend a lot of time on side effects and dosing and adherence, but maybe we need to try to remember to throw in that extra line of you're eating really well now, you're gaining weight, which is great, but try to watch. You may gain too much weight if you're not careful. Um, I rely on nutrition, and I've tried to use the Weight Management Center to some extent, try to get patients connected with options for physical activity, and then really follow the principles of the Diabetes Prevention Program, which HIV providers probably could do a better job of, um, but there's a lot of resources that help patients with lifestyle modification. And then now I'll we'll breeze through because we probably don't manage it that often, but if you're worried about fatty liver, your patients shouldn't drink. Potentially, if, if you have data suggesting they might benefit, which generally means biopsy data, you'd give them vitamin E or other insulin sensitizing agents. Uh, and then that graphic, which is already dated from 2017, uh, all those little words are new agents in development for fatty liver. So I think we'll see, hopefully in the next five or so years, some new options for treating metabolic disorders like fatty liver. We're not there yet. And if the patient has advanced disease, they should be seeing hepatology for screening. Cardiovascular disease risk, we've got pretty good HIV guidelines for this. Uh, we actually have specific guidelines for lipid management, and then we're really supposed to do what everyone else does, get our patients to quit smoking, try to manage blood pressure and diabetes, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, this data is a little bit old, but we generally don't have our patients at goal. Uh, there aren't a lot of HIV-specific uh, management techniques. Generally, we still get everybody on therapy as quickly as possible in hopes that this will attenuate any inflammation or um, immune dysfunction, try to get them onto what we call metabolically neutral antiretroviral therapy. I think that's harder and harder to define. We thought those newer agents, the integrase inhibitors, were going to be our metabolically neutral antiretrovirals, but they may not be. Um, and I'm struggling with whether to switch some patients off of integrase inhibitors. I don't know if the patient I presented a second ago, maybe it makes sense to put her back on a triple. She was doing fine. You know, she didn't actually have any of the complications I was worried about. I just was trying to prevent them and maybe making that change put her in a worse position. Uh, other interventions, metformin probably works. There's actually an agent called tesamorelin, which is a growth hormone releasing hormone analog. Its only FDA indication is HIV visceral adiposity. It's actually very effective, but it's expensive. It has to be injected, and its benefits essentially are erased as soon as you go off it. So you're really committing people to a long, potentially lifelong treatment course. And we don't have a lot of great safety data on that. I was part of a study that's still ongoing where we were giving it for fatty liver, and it actually really looks like it melts away liver fat, but again, that benefit seems to disappear when we stop it. But I think as proof of concept, it may be leading us towards potential new therapies. Uh, we use adult obesity drugs in HIV, but the data is limited. Uh, we get nervous. Drugs like Orlistat, we worry might affect absorption of our HIV medication, so we're very cautious. Um, and so additional data on use of those drugs in our population would be valuable. And we've had patients undergo bariatric surgery and overall do very well. With some minor tinkering in their dosing, they can maintain virologic suppression and do fine. So I think referring patients that can afford it for bariatric surgery is reasonable if they have indication. But we still face a lot of barriers to care. Um, and what's on the left here is a note I got. Right when I started, I was thrilled that we had such a fantastic weight management program. So I was sending everybody that I took care of who needed help. 
Unfortunately, they can usually get a consultation, but a lot of the services are expensive, and so you can't. Uh, our patients are unable to afford them. Uh, this particular patient went on to gain. I sent her, I think, October when I started here in September or August, and she was just diagnosed with breast cancer, sleep apnea, and I've had to put her on her third antihypertensive drug. So she's got all the obesity-related complications. I put here a picture of the diabetes prevention program uh, links on the CDC website, which I've referred a lot of patients to, because it's got some nice differing levels of uh, medical literacy information for patients to use. Um, and then at the bottom, our local YMCA has a diabetes prevention program, which I thought it was free, but it looks like maybe it costs a little something, but again, I think offers an option if we can't uh, get our patients into something through our own program. Uh, I've looked at a couple of lifestyle interventions. We were doing a trial um, using intermittent fasting, so I don't know if people know much about this. This is eating very little a couple days a week. Uh, for most people, that means eating about 600 calories two days a week. It's interesting because it doesn't necessarily reduce weight, but it tremendously improves insulin sensitivity and brings down inflammatory markers. Eventually, patients will lose some weight if they can stick with it. But it's an interesting strategy because it doesn't involve the same degree of calorie counting or you know, label reading or some of the more challenging aspects of dieting. Uh, it has not been a successful trial, mainly because when we were designing it, most of the nutritionists said we should put people in the hospital the days they're supposed to fast and make them fast. We're like, no, no, they'll be fine. But in fact, it looks like most people really do have a hard time adhering. The way we were doing it is with shakes, but most people really have a hard time sticking to 600 calories a day. But there are other novel diet strategies that are being investigated in small trials in HIV that I hope will be a benefit to our patients. Some drug trials, uh, and then a, a part that I think is really underexplored is how the microbiome and perhaps genetics contribute. Because not every patient has this pathologic weight gain, but there seems to be a phenotype where people just go crazy. As examples I've given you where they gain tons of weight and get tons of complications. Trying to identify those patients before it happens would be fantastic. So hopefully I've convinced you that HIV patients are overall doing great. They're getting fatter, unfortunately. It's associated with metabolic complications, and we're still at a bit of a loss on how to manage it, but hopefully there'll be some uh, progress in the next five or 10 years. Thanks. All right, thank you, Dr. Morse, for an excellent walk through the state of the literature and HIV and, and the obesity uh, implications there. So I know there must be questions uh, for Dr. Morris on this topic. A few times, yeah. I'm a medical oncologist, and what is bad for some may be good for others. Are integrase inhibitors appetite stimulants? You know, the, the data on what the mechanism is is pretty limited. I, I'm not sure. That would make more sense to me than anything else because they had done some studies to look at how they affect glucose metabolism and how they affect, you know, lipids and hormone levels, and all of that was very reassuring. So perhaps it's not a medicine we ask people to take with, me with food. You know, we, we say you can take it with food, but it's not one. Some of our older medicines we'd say, oh, make sure you take this with plenty of food or so it's not one where we're instructing them in any way that would drive that, but it does seem like they have an almost pathologic intake, you know, as the driver. If I might, you know, many of the drugs that are approved go through several levels of development, including primate studies. Mm -hmm. Do the primates, the preclinical work, suggest weight gaining no HIV primates, for example, if you have? Yeah, actually, I don't know. I would have to look. Yeah, I, I don't think there was a weight gain signal in the early trials. I don't think any of us were expecting it. Uh, which is why I think most of us were in denial about it, but it's becoming more and more clear. I, I mean, maybe there's more to it than just the integrase inhibitor, but something is driving the degree of weight gain in a big portion of our patients right now. That was fantastic, and boy, you've covered a, a waterfront, but you've also raised a lot of questions, and everybody here knows I'm going to ask a question about aging. Okay. There was a time when it was thought that HIV was a model of accelerated aging. Now, as you tease all these things out, do you think it's still a model of accelerated aging, or is it all these other factors that mimic the com complicated issues? Because there is anti-aging treatment now, and, uh, and we have a lot of it going on here. A related question is cognitive function. 
are there studies being done? Because of course that's a major focus of here of us here as well. So I, I do think HIV is an ex and the disease of accelerated aging, and there's good data to support that. How that contributes, independent <clears throat> of some of these other risk factors, I think is unclear. Um, and the way we define accelerated aging depends. Sometimes it's very basic science benchy. When we try to look at markers like frailty, we do see accelerated frailty. We see accelerated fractures. We see other, you know, more clinical manifestations of rapid aging. Um, in terms of neurocognitive, and func neurocognitive function, I cut that data and I still went too long. Um, there's several cohorts that are looking at relationships between neurocognitive function, aging markers, and me metabolism. And weight gain and HIV negatives is also associated with increased risk of dementia. So I think we're still trying to tease it out. It is hard because our populations often have abused drugs, they often have alcohol in the background, they have vascular disease risk factors. So finding a distinct signal for, say, obesity or HIV-related aging in dementia is challenging, but it is an area that is still being studied. There's still two huge cohorts in the U.S. looking at neurocognitive function in HIV. I hope we could put our heads together here because yeah. there's such an interest with the Alzheimer's Center yeah. here now. Thank you. All right, maybe time for a final question. So uh, one, I have two questions. The first one is, is there an association with like thyroid dysfunction in people on antiretroviral therapy? That's kind of a more straightforward question. The second one is, is on the cardiovascular disease kind of section. Do they know if it's associated more with like acute MI or vasospasm or artery dissection? Um, and have they stratified that? Um, so thyroid dysfunction, we always check it. You know, we see abnormal weight gain. Uh, it does not appear to be more prevalent. There is a syndrome of like a thyroiditis that we sometimes see with immune reconstitution in HIV that can then lead to a hypothyroidism. But I don't think that's a prevalent cause of what we're seeing. The cardiovascular disease risk, there is a risk of acute MI. There's debate about whether there's more generalized almost vasculitis kind of manifestation, including things like stroke. Um, and then there's more heart failure and diastolic dysfunction, but again, teasing out whether that's specifically related to HIV, they have some data from animal models that support that. Um, I think clinically it's hard to tease out whether there's uh, truly an HIV independent effect. Usually we see it in the setting of traditional cardiovascular risk factors. Does that address Thank the you. question? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again to Dr. Great. Moore Thanks for your for presentation. Coming.